Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's service. God is using the ministry of Lakeside to change so many people's lives, and we are hearing many stories of life change and would love to hear yours as well. If God has used the ministry of Lakeside to change your life and make a difference, then please email us at amen at lakesidechurch.ca. Hi, my name is Victoria, and my husband and I have been coming to Lakeside Central for almost a year, and I have been involved in the Celebrate Recovery ministry here for four years. For most of my childhood and young adult life, I was abused physically, sexually, and emotionally. As a young child, I learned what fear was, and I never felt safe in daily life. Anxiety also became the norm, and it was hard for me to trust people. I committed my life to Christ when I was nine and grew up in church, but due to my childhood experiences, I have always had doubts about my faith. I was taught that God was a God of wrath, and I felt unloved by Him. My faith became a bunch of rules I carried out to win God's favour. I was scared to do anything wrong. In my teenage years, I became very ill with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. For more than half my life, I was so sick, I depended on others for everything, and I relied on a wheelchair to get around. I reached a point emotionally where I became suicidal, and I spent a few months in the Homewood where I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, and anxiety disorder. I had kept my abuse and fears a secret for over 20 years. When I started to talk about my life with professionals at the Homewood, my physical health improved dramatically. Within two months, I was walking independently through the Homewood grounds, and I was able to read eight books in two months. I had not been able to concentrate on a book for over 17 years. The doctors explained that keeping all these emotions and fears inside had harmed my body physically in the form of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. And when I started to talk about it and get the help I needed, my body started to heal. My relationship with God also started to heal at this time. And I learned the true meaning of God's grace through Celebrate Recovery and Church. I have been in remission from chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia for six years. I now rollerblade, swim, and dance. My mental health is still a struggle, but I have professional support as well as a wonderful support group at Celebrate Recovery and my amazing husband to help me. I am now involved in ministry because I want to be, not out of fear of God's wrath and I am learning to find joy in reading and studying God's Word. One of my favorite quotes is what the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the creator calls the butterfly. It reminds me of the Bible verse from 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. I have said goodbye to my old life as a caterpillar, and I am now living as a new creation through Christ. For the first time in my life, I am not suffering from abuse, and I am free from fear and anxiety. I feel safe, loved, and accepted for who I am, a butterfly.
Good morning, everyone. Glad to have all of you here. I know some of you are family visiting today uh, because there's child dedications after, and we're so glad to have you here. And uh, those of you who are in the cafe, welcome. And those many online, we're glad to have you here as well. And before I get started, Victoria, thanks for sharing your story this morning. She's down in front. I can see her here. And uh, it takes a lot of courage to do that, and thanks, Victoria, for doing that. It was awesome. which really leads us into what we want to talk about today, and that is the whole idea of fear. And there is none of us who are immune from fear. There isn't a person in this room who says, can say to themselves, I've never been afraid, because the reality is, to varying degrees and in different ways, we all wrestle with fear. It's what it means to be human. I mean, when you look at the events of the last week or so here in Canada, we see the two soldiers were killed, and there are other related events. We, I think we fear a little bit more. And we hear all of the news about Ebola, and uh, now there are cases in New York City. And I think inside of us, there's this little sense of anxiety, this little sense of fear. You know, we can watch the news, and we can, uh, you know, go online and get our, wherever we get our news from, and we can look at some of the world events, what's happening in the Middle East and in other parts of the world, and it can actually create a degree of fear in all of us. Fear is something that all of us wrestle with, and it's not a neutral emotion. Fear isn't something we just have and, it, and it's neutral, because fear often comes with consequences. And many of the choices that you have made and I have made that we later regret and pay a price for often flowed because we had some degree of fear. And fear drove some very uh, important decisions the wrong direction. All flowed out of fear. And fear can infect us in so many ways. It really can. It creates this anxiety. It creates this uncertainty. It creates uh, health issues. We saw that in the story, panic attacks. We can be overwhelmed. It can be our focus. Uh, it can hurt our health. It, it, it's downright toxic, this idea of fear. And God knew that fear was something that all of us would wrestle with. And, and, and in the Bible, there are 365 commands that say fear not. Not suggestions, but commands, and God expresses them to us because he knows what it means to be human is to be fearful. And what follows those commands most often when it, God says fear not, it's these words, I am with you. And we know that no matter what we go through, how dark it gets, how hard it gets, how much of a struggle it is, is that we have the presence of God. He says fear not because I'm with you through it. But that doesn't stop us from fearing, does it? Paul was writing to the, the Roman church, and they were in a, a time of upheaval, and there was a lots of fear and uncertainty in that church. And Paul says, you don't have to become a slave again to fear. The reason you don't have to be a slave is that you have a spirit of adoption. You've been chosen by God as an adopted child. You have a daddy in heaven who wants the very best for you. He has made you a joint heir with his, his son Jesus. And because we've been adopted, we have a father who wants the best for us. He says, we don't have to be slaves to fear, and yet sometimes, even knowing that, we become slaves to fear. And Paul writes to a pastor, his name is Timothy, who was filled with fear. He was a young pastor, and, and it affected his health. And Paul says these words, for God gave us a spirit, God's Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, and we're not to fear. We don't have a spirit in us that's all about fear. The Holy Spirit is not about fear, but he's given us a spirit through the Holy Spirit of power, power to face our fear, of love to love those who cause our fear, and of self-control to deal with our fear. And if we put all this together, that we have a God who is with us no matter what, that we have an adopted Father who wants the very best for us, that we have a, 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 a Holy Spirit in us that says, we are not to give in to fear, but to have power and to love and self-control. And we put all that together and we shouldn't fear. But we do. We all do. All of us are prone to fear. And so the big question I want to look at for just a moment, I want you to think about it, I'm going to give you some examples of is this question. What is your greatest fear? What is it? And what is that fear doing to you? How is it affecting you? I'm not talking about phobias, you know, the afraid of heights, afraid of water. I'm not talking about those kind of fears. And I'm not talking about that healthy kind of fear that all of us, all of us need to have that protects us. I'm talking about another type of fear, that kind of toxic fear that overwhelms, creates anxiety, creates uncertainty, and often creates difficult decisions that we make. 
And maybe today you're here and your fear is failure. You're so afraid to fail because somehow in your mind you've equated failing and being a failure. And because you're afraid of failure, you're not taking any risk. You're playing it safe and life is boring and bland because risks bring excitement to life. Or on the other side, you're afraid of failure and it's driving the way you work or overwork or it's driving the way you study or overstudy. It drives you pretty hard and it's an unrelenting taskmaster and you push and push because you're afraid of failure and you feel exhausted and overwhelmed. Part of the reason that we fear failure is we fear what other people will say about our failure, don't we? What will mom say, dad say, my friends say, my boss say, what will they say if I fail? And we're afraid of people who have expectations placed upon us and we're afraid of them and so we feel uh, we fear failure because of them. And some of us push ourselves pretty hard because of this fear of failure to the point of perfection. And that causes us to do some really crazy things because we want everything to be perfect and people in our lives to be perfect and us to be perfect. And we can push ourselves pretty hard. And, we, and one of the reactions to fearing failure is wanting to control everything. The circumstances, the people around us. We want to be in control. And that does some things to people in our relational world. And not only are we afraid of our own failure, but sometimes we're afraid of the failure of a spouse or our children, because somehow that will reflect bad on, bad on us, and we'll be failures because of their failure. And the fear of failure is one big one. And lots of us here this morning have that fear of failure. For some of us, there may be that fear of being poor. Maybe it's because of something in your past. I, I went through a season of life where our family was what I would call, call poor. And what happens is we get so driven to succeed, to earn money, and we overload our schedule, and our priorities get out of order, and our work ethic is off the charts, all because we're afraid of not having enough money. And we work, and we work, and we work, and money becomes what drives us, and it pushes us hard. But what we don't understand is it also affects those in our relational world and the other important things. And we're distant from family and distant from friends, and even distant from uh, genuine church community because we're so driven, focused on this one thing, because we're afraid of being poor. Or maybe we're afraid of intimacy. You're afraid of getting close to someone, to somebody else, because you're afraid they'll get to see beneath the surface, and you don't like what you see, and you know that they'll not like that either. And we build these walls around our hearts, and our relationships get kind of superficial, and we hurt others out of fear of being hurt, and we stay distant, and we feel lonely, and Our souls never connect with another human soul, and we are created to be that way. It's not a fun place to be, and we often get there because of fear, or maybe it's the fear of losing something important to you. Maybe it's the fear of losing your job, or your some kind of financial loss, or a prized possession, or image, or reputation, or maybe it's the fear of losing someone. And because of that, it drives so much of what we do. And we try to put our hands around it, and we try to control it, and we try to grip hard at it and say, I'm not going to give this up without a fight. And we do some crazy things that make some awful decisions, and we smother the people who we're afraid we're going to lose, which kind of leads to the next one is that we can, that fear of being abandoned by a spouse or our children or a close friend. And what we do is because we're afraid of that, we end up smothering these people in these relationships. We try to control them. We compromise in so many ways because we're afraid they'll leave. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy for so many people because that we're afraid they'll leave and we smother them and they do leave. Or maybe it's a fear of authority. You just don't like anyone to have authority over you for whatever reason. Something in your past has created this. And you not only resist authority, you resist mutual accountability. And because of this, there's this battleground going on in your home with your spouse because you can't even have mutual accountability and then you you can't work for anybody. You can't be led by anybody. The only boss you like is yourself and you're not crazy about you. And we complain and we criticize and we point fingers and we tell everybody in authority how wrong they are because we have this fear of living under authority. For a bunch of you, maybe it's a fear of being single. And you can't handle a thought, and you're willing to compromise standards that you once said, I will never compromise this. And now you have. Or maybe there are moral boundaries that you said, I'll never cross, but now you have. Because you're afraid if you don't, the relationship will end. And sometimes it ends up being a toxic relationship. And sometimes we're so afraid of being single, we'll stay in a wrong, the wrong kind of relationship, a toxic, broken relationship, simply because we're afraid of being alone, which is wrong. And it robs us of life. 
Or maybe it's a health fear. And, you, you, know, you know, maybe because you hear so much on the news about diseases and cancer and other things, and you become paranoid, and as soon as you get an ache or a pain, you're online looking at the symptoms, and you've got something, don't you? And you're so worried about it that you've taken your eating to extreme, and you've eliminated lots of foods from your diet, and you're driving others crazy, and you know what it's like. Or maybe it's the fear of commitment and your relationships are shallow because you're just afraid to commit. You've been through a string of relationship after relationship. You're just afraid to commit because you might feel trapped and you don't want to do that. Or maybe it's the fear of the future. I think there's a lot of us here today. We look out over the horizon tomorrow, next month, a year from now, and things seem so uncertain and we feel so anxious and it looks dark, and it looks bleak, and the odds look like it's against us. We don't know how it's all going to turn out, and we're allowing that fear of the future, whatever it is, to rob us of joy, rob us of peace, rob us of focus right now in the present. And it's really doing a number on us. You know, I think the one fear that all of us struggle with from time to time is that fear of rejection. We're afraid of not being accepted because people are so important to all of us. And we have done things that we, have sh we shouldn't have done because we're afraid of being rejected by some person or by some group. We think, if I don't go with them to this place that I know is wrong, they'll never invite me again, and I don't want to be rejected by those friends. Or if I don't make this decision at work, which I know it's really bending the rules, and I shouldn't be making it, but my boss is asking, and my coworkers are depending on it, and if I don't do it, I may never get that promotion, and I may be isolated in my office. And to avoid rejection, we make choices and we compromise. And we're not pleasing God in any way, shape, or form. And we get so addicted to approval that all we can say is yes, and we never say no because we're afraid if we say no, someone won't like us. And we get, a, we get on that performance treadmill and we get exhausted because all we're doing is running to please other people. And we become resentful of others and we become resentful of those who are popular. You know, some parents are afraid of their kids' rejection. And so they do, you know, they're, they're more of a friend than a parent. And they should be a parent first. And they don't discipline and they give their kids everything they want. It's not healthy for the child. It's not healthy for the parents. But they do it because they don't want to be rejected by their kids. And at some point, those kids end up rejecting them. Some people are afraid of God's rejection. We're afraid of God. We live and see God as this cosmic cop, and we're afraid of God, that he'll reject us, that he won't bless us, that he'll bring something bad into our lives, and we live in that kind of fear of the rejection, even of God. And there are fears that I have not mentioned. And you're saying, but that's my fear. And you know what it is, and you know what it's doing to you, and you don't like it, and you'd like to stop, but you don't know how. And I think that we need to take a moment and have a little confession to ourselves. Don't say it to somebody beside you. But maybe just write on your sermon order. Just keep it in your head. This is the thing that I fear the most. Because we all have something. We all have something we're afraid of. And that fear can drive us to make decisions that are not healthy, decisions that we regret, and decisions that can hurt us and hurt others. So what is that thing that you fear the most? You know, if there's one Bible story that I think details the consequences of fear, it's a, it's a story in 1 Samuel chapter 15, story of King Saul. And it's one story where we can just look at it and look at the details, and we realize that this is what happens when we give in to fear. So I'm going to read through the story, make a few comments, put a few verses on the screen. Then we're going to look at four consequences to giving in to fear. So let's look at the story. It says, And Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his house Israel. What he's saying in this is he's saying, hey, you know, this is Samuel speaking, the last of the judges. No more judges. Israel wanted a king to be like the people around them. They got a king. God said, not going to be a good thing, and it ended up not being that way. But Samuel anoints uh, Saul, and he says, hey, by the way, Saul, I need to tell you, it's God who anointed you as king. It's not by what you did. It's not your good looks. It's not your smarts. It's not your leadership ability. It's God. It's the sovereignty of God that has appointed you as king. And then he goes on. He says, Thus saith the Lord, pay attention, he says. I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. He says, I, I, There's something in history that I remember. And then he says these words. I want to put these ones on the screen. 
Now go, Saul, and strike Amalek, the Amalekites, and devote to destruction all they have. Don't spare them, but kill both man and women, child and infant, ox, sheep, camel and donkey. Now I know some of you read that verse and go, that's why I don't like the Bible. Because I don't like these verses. This is why I think that Old Testament God is this real mean guy. Because look what he's asking. Destroy everything. Well, we need to understand, and I need to give you some explanation about this one verse, and that is that God always works in the historical context of the culture. Always. And this is a military culture in this day. And the, really the outcome of being the winners of a military campaign is that your God is the true and living God and the God of your enemy, if you defeat him, he's no God at all. So this is kind of the war of the gods going on here. And so that's what's at stake, God's reputation. And here's how you win the war in those days. Destroy everything. It's the only way you win. There's no partial victory. Victory is destroying everything. So he's saying, hey, you know what? My reputation's on the line. That's why this has to happen. Secondly, though, he says, remember what uh, the Amalekites did 400 years earlier. He takes them back to a reference point. The nation Israel is moving from Egypt into the promised land. And as they're going, they have to go through the land where the Amalekites are. And the Amalekites say, oh, feel free, go through our land. There's like a million people. And the army goes first. That's how it happened in that day. And then the men. And as soon as the army and the men got into the distance, the Amalekites, who were like terrorists, attacked the women and the children and the vulnerable and the crippled and the lame and the stragglers for whatever reason they were straggling. And they slaughtered them. And God said in Exodus 17, 4, I will blot them out of your memory. This is divine justice. God is getting them for what they did. He's bringing justice to this nation that, that was so evil and destructive. That's what's going on here. On top of that, God knows that if they leave people around, they'll influence Israel. Israel is so easily influenced by their neighbors. So God says, you know what, I can't have any neighbors around because they'll negatively influence my people. And some of you understand that because you are parents and you got kids, you say, I don't want my kids hanging out with them. And I'll do whatever I can. And that's what's going on here. So we have to understand all of this is happening in the culture. Now we'll read on. It says that Saul puts an army together and they easily defeat the Amalekites. Easily defeat them. And we pick it up in verse 8 to 9. It says, and he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Uh-oh. That doesn't sound like destruction of everybody to me. And devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen uh, of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, and that, all that was despised and worthless. They devoted to destruction. They did exactly what the Amalekites did to them. And um, it says that God was pretty grieved, and he regretted that he'd made Saul king. And Samuel was so upset that he weeped all night, and so Samuel goes to have a meeting with Saul. Saul set up an altar to his victory. Look at us, how fabulous we are in victory. And Samuel comes to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I've got it right. I've obeyed God. Samuel says, Oh, really? What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? You didn't so defeat them. You didn't do what you were told. You disobeyed. And... Samuel says to Saul, you know what? God is really upset with you. He regrets that he made you king. You were to defeat the people. You were to destroy everything. You were not to do any of this. You have disobeyed God. And Saul does what we, did, we do. And Saul said to Samuel, I've obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission to which the Lord has sent me. I brought Agag the king out of Amalek, and I've devoted the Amalekites to destruction. He's saying, hey, I did everything I'm supposed to. And Samuel's saying, no, no, you had partial obedience. And partial obedience is just obedience dressed up to look good. And then he says, 
He gets nervous and he's feeling bad. And look what he does. He does what so many of us do when we get kind of caught not fully obeying. What does he say? The people took it, not me. It wasn't me. It was the people. Sheep and oxen. And then he rationalizes and justifies why it's okay. We took these best things because we want to sacrifice them to the Lord. But they disobeyed. They disobeyed. And Samuel reads the verdict that Saul is no longer to be king. And Saul gets real nervous. And he says, Saul said to Samuel, he has kind of trumps up, he kind of works up this sort of confession. I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words. Because why? I feared the people. He did it all because he was afraid of the people. He feared the people. Fear of rejection. Fear of these people, what they would think of him. They wouldn't applaud him. They wouldn't approve of him as king. They might, you know, have a revolt and pull him, you know, he would no longer be king. He wouldn't be able to reign. And so out of the fear of his re- of rejection and fear of losing his role as king, he gave in to the fear and he made a decision to partially obey God, but not fully. And then he keeps going on. If you read the rest of the story, he has all of these uh, confessions. He said, Samuel, Samuel, on behalf of God, forgive me, pardon me, pretend like it never happened, restore my reputation before the people, make, make it like it never happened at all, please, please, please. And Samuel says, no, stop, stop, stop. God has rejected you as king. Why? Because you feared the people and you obeyed their voice. You gave in to what you feared. Because here's the principle. Fear leads to compromise that has consequences. And there are four consequences of Saul's fear. And I think it can affect all of us from time to time. One of these or all of these. The first one is this, it's missed opportunity. See, Saul gave in to his fear, and he missed the opportunity to be the longest standing king of Israel, to have a long and prosperous reign, to be in the Hall of, uh, Hall of Fame of Kings. He missed the opportunity to turn Israel into the most powerful nation in the world, which was on the verge of doing. But David made that happen, the following king. But I think Saul would have been the king of the most powerful nation in the world. I think Saul might have got a chance to build a temple, to leave a legacy, to leave his mark on history. But he didn't. He had no mark, no history, nothing significant or heroic. He missed the countless ways that God could have marked his reign and marked his life simply because he gave into fear. And we'll never know what God might have done through the kingship of Saul and his rule and his reign over Israel. We'll never get to know that because he missed the opportunity. And you miss opportunity when you give into fear. And I think some of us have stories. And we can say, here's a story of a missed opportunity. I gave into fear, and I missed out on a great opportunity because I gave into fear. And we give into fear, and we never get to see God work in our lives. We never give him the chance. We never see what could be and what would have been because we miss that opportunity, because we compromise out of fear, and we disobey God out of fear. And we take control of the situation and we do it our way because of fear. And we make those decisions out of fear. We miss out on the great opportunities that God had waiting for us. See, every point of fear is a point of opportunity to say to God, you can work in my life and I'm gonna give you the chance and I'm gonna watch you do something miraculous, something significant, something beautiful. I'm not giving into fear. I'm gonna give you the chance to work. But when you give into fear, you give up that right and you miss those opportunities. And some of you have had business fears And God could have done amazing things in your business, but you gave in to those fears, and now you're limping along. And some of you are fearing singleness, and you've jumped into relationships that you knew were not great ones, and maybe you've missed out on the best relationship God has for you. Some of you fear rejection, and you've made choices, and you've compromised. And you may miss out on the great opportunity that God could have connected you with the right people in the right group if you just hadn't compromised. Giving to fear can lead to misopportunity. And we miss the chance to see how God could have worked in our lives if we had just simply said, God, I obey you, and I'll do it your way in the middle of my fear. The second thing is ripple effects. Fear has ripple effects. It hap- happened in Saul's life. We're told that the rest of Saul's life, he was a pretty miserable, paranoid, jealous, envious man trying to control everything and control everyone so nothing bad happened to him. He isolated himself from the important people in his life. David, who was there and, 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 and calmed his heart when it was dark and, and, and paranoid. He tried to kill him. 
Jonathan, his son, he wasn't much of a father to him. And he gave in to his fear, and he ended up the rest of his life a very miserable, dark man because he gave in to this fear. And he never saw the ripple effects coming. I don't think that when he stood there and made that decision that he ever thought about how this would play out over time. And we would have loved to say, you know what, Saul? Stop. Don't do it. We've seen the story of your life. We'd love to show up, right, and say, don't do it. Don't give in to fear because the ripple effects, it's going to affect so many things in your life and it's going to make your life dark and it's not going to make it a good thing. We would warn him, wouldn't we? We need to warn ourselves that sometimes there are ripple effects when we give in to our fear that we don't even see coming. And I think the greatest ripple effect in Saul's life was that his son who should have been king was no longer going to be allowed to be king. And him and his son died together on the battlefield. And he isolated his son and he was distant from his son and his son's inheritance and his son's reign was taken away from him. And Saul never saw that happening when he was making that choice to give in to his fear. And we never see it coming either. We never see it coming. And there's lots, we need to look at the lives of people like Saul and say, this guy, he gave in to his fear. Look at the negative ripples. Oh, I gotta pay attention because that's what happens. The third thing, this one will take a minute to explain, but you end up losing the very thing you feared losing. The very thing you fear losing, you end up losing when you give in to your fear. You see, Saul's greatest fear was to lose the, the, uh, the applause of the people the respect of the people, his, his, his throne, to be king over the nation of Israel. He feared losing that more than anything else. That's what he feared losing. He felt, feared rejection. He fear, feared losing that. And the very thing he feared, he lost. He lost his role as king, and history tells us, history outside the Bible tells us that Saul lost respect among the army. Saul lost respect among the people of the nations around them. They used to be afraid of him. They weren't afraid of him anymore. He lost everything he was afraid of losing because he gave into his fear. You see, I've seen parents do this one. I've seen parents so afraid of losing the relationship with their children that there's no discipline, no guidance, no direction, no boundaries, no saying no, it's all about fear. And in their teen years, those same kids become rebellious to their parents because of all of that and they become distant or they become you know, non-communicative or they, they're right away from their parents. And the very thing those parents feared losing, they lose. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy so many times. And you might be afraid of being rejected, so you compromise and you get rejected. Or you're afraid of being single and you compromise a relationship and that relationship ends and it's only heartache. Or you're afraid to fail and you compromise and you end up failing anyway. Because so often the consequence is the very thing we're afraid of losing when we compromise is the very thing we lose. And the last one is this one. It does something to our relationship with God. And in this story, it says that God rejects Saul, that he's sorry that he made him king. And I don't think that God just coldly rejecting him. I think God is making a choice out of a wounded heart. I believe the heart of God is wounded because he looked at Saul and said, Saul, all you needed to do is trust me. Just trust me. But you didn't trust me enough and you gave in to your fear. You know, it's like us, we say, oh God, you're a great God. I want a relationship when it comes, you know, a relationship with you. But when it comes to the thing that I fear, I don't know if I can totally trust you, God, on this one. You know, I want you in my life, but I'm afraid to surrender that area that I fear the most because you might not give me what I want the way I want and when I want, and I don't know if I trust you, God. I'm afraid, God, if I trust you, the thing I fear that I won't get, I won't get. And we don't trust God. And it wounds the heart of God because trust builds relationship, and a lack of trust wounds a relationship. And a relationship with God gets wounded, and it takes a hit because we don't trust God enough because we're afraid of what he will do and how he will do it if we do trust him. And I want you to think about that thing that you're so afraid of, that one fear that grips you from time to time. What is it doing to you? And what opportunities might you miss if you give in to it? And what ripple effects might there be? And what might you lose if you give in to that fear? And what will it do to your relationship with God? And some of us, you're sitting here now, and you're going, okay, how do I deal with this? Because I do feel fear, and I want to sort it out. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to give you the solution. 
But it's going to seem a little bit counterintuitive because it's not about facing your fears with willpower. It's not facing your fears head on. It's not about, you know, some sort of cognitive uh, calculation about how to deal with fear. Here's how you deal with fear. You fight fear with fear. And you're going, just a second. I don't get that. And it is a little bit, a little bit of a counterintuitive thing. However, it's going to be in this whole series, so we might as well get the point of it right now. Here's the verses that support it. The fear of the Lord, that's one type of fear, is the beginning of wisdom. All wise decisions start when we fear the Lord. All those who practice it, the fear of the Lord, have a good understanding. Understanding is about perception of how things are. It's like knowledge. And then knowing how to apply them wisely. And his praise endures forever to who? Those who fear the Lord. Solomon writes these words, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Knowledge is, again, about perception. It's about understanding what's going on. It's understanding the big picture and then wisely deciding based on that perception. Fools despise wisdom and instruction, but it starts with the fear of the Lord. David writes, oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and work for those who take refuge in you. He says there is an abundance stored up for every one of us who fear the Lord. And so we have to choose to fear the Lord to fight the fears that we feel. Now, some of you are here this morning, you don't like the phrase, the fear of the Lord, because you have this unhealthy picture of who God is. Maybe you developed it in your religious upbringing. God is some sort of a cosmic cop, ready to pounce, ready to write you the ticket, ready to punish, ready to withhold blessing, ready to just mess your life up if you take one little step across the line. And that's what you feel about God. And when you think of the fear of God, you say, oh, I definitely fear God. But we're not talking here about dread or terror or being afraid. That's not the fear of God. The fear of God begins with belief. It believes that God is all-powerful. It's a belief that God is all loving. It is a belief that God is all wise, and you need all those working together. It is a belief that God is sovereign and in control. It is a belief that God will allow the consequences to happen if you make the wrong choices. It is a belief that God wants the very best for every one of you this morning. It starts with the right belief about God. And you have this reverence and this awe for that God when you get that right picture in your mind. The fear of the Lord is being willing to say yes to God no matter what. Why? How do I say yes to God no matter what? Because I believe He's loving and wise and powerful and sovereign and has my best interest at heart. It's about saying yes to God and saying no to the compromising choices when we get afraid because of who God is. It is a whatever you ask God, I will do kind of attitude. And we would add no matter what. It's like writing God a blank check for your life and saying, God, you can write anything in you want. I give you full permission. It's about transferring trust. It's transferring trust from the things that we fear, from ourselves and from others. We transfer our complete trust over to God. But complete trust requires obedience. It requires surrender. It requires us saying yes to God no matter what he asks. It is complete surrender and total obedience. It's not facing your fear and working your way through it. It's transferring your trust over to God, saying, I'll do it your way. I'm willing not to compromise or to give in the fear. Whatever you ask God, however you lead, I'm doing it your way. However it turns out, whatever the opportunities, whatever the ripple effects, I'm going to leave it all up to you. God, I trust you that much. But it's not an easy thing to do, and we wrestle with that. And you know why? Why do we wrestle with that? Because we're afraid what we're going to miss out on. If I transfer trust, I might miss out on the very thing I'm afraid I'm not going to get. Right? We don't trust God for the area of our life because we think that will cause us to miss out on what we want. It's kind of like we're saying, you know what? If I do it God's way, then I'm going to miss out on something that I want. I fear I won't get that. And I'm concerned that if I do this, God might do this, and I'm afraid of what God might do. Hey, God, I'm 35. I'm single. Great relationship, but it's just the wrong person. Toxic, causing me to compromise. Push my faith to the, to, to the sort of the side. It's not a good thing for me, God, but God, I have to compromise these values and maybe moral values. God, I gotta do it because this might be the last chance, God. It might be my last chance. And then we rationalize and justify, right? And we say, well, God, you know how painful it is to feel this way. Yes, he does. 
And we don't trust God with this. We're afraid we'll miss out and God won't give us what I want. We need to remember no matter what we're afraid that God won't give us, we need to remind ourselves that the Bible says that every gift that God gives us is a perfect gift. God only gives perfect gifts to his children. And he knows what that perfect gift looks like to you. It might, you don't even know what the perfect gift for yourself is, but he does, and he's willing to give it to you. And no one who ever trusted God completely could say that they missed out because they're willing to follow God's way and not compromise their beliefs or their ways because of fear. No one said, I trusted God and I did it his way and I wrote him the blank check. Oh, and by it turned out awful. No one says that. But there's lots of people who have sad stories because they didn't follow God's way and they compromised because of fear. It's about transferring our trust over to God. And here's the statement I want you to live with and let it ring in your ears. What you fear the most or what creates the most fear in you is the area in your life that you trust God the least. Your area of greatest fear is the area you trust God the least. If you're afraid to do it God's way in that area of your life, then you can identify where you're most afraid. See, we never think of it this way, but when fear can actually become kind of a God, and we can worship and trust that God more than the real God if we're willing to compromise because of fear. You... It's about trusting God. It's about saying, God, you've got what's best in store, and I'm just going to let it go. It's not easy, but it starts with trust. And you can have fear and not compromise, and that's okay. It happens to all of us. You can have fear and say, I'm going to trust God. See, fear, faith is not the absence of fear. People with great faith had lots of fear. They just did it God's way. Faith is about tenacious obedience to say, whatever you say, God, I'm going to do. No matter what, I trust you. I have faith in you. You'll still feel fear as you walk that road of faith. You will. It happens all the time. But it's transferring our trust over to God in the middle of our fear and obeying God tenaciously. It's a trust transfer. It's about obedience and it's about surrender. So here's the question. What is it that you're not trusting God for? What is the one thing the one circumstance, the one opportunity, the one longing, the one desire that you fear missing out more than you want to trust God for? What do you fear more than you fear God? What desire, what thing, what pleasure, what relationship do you fear more than you fear God? It comes down to a single decision when we stand at the door of fear. Will I choose to trust God? Or will I choose to give in to my fear? It's that simple. It's not always in the big decisions. It's in the little decisions we make time and time again. Who do you choose to trust? Do you choose to trust God and say, okay, God, you've got it figured out, and even if it doesn't make sense, I'm going with you because I'm trusting you. Or are you going to give in to fear because you're afraid of missing out and you don't think God will give you what you want because you've got this wrong picture of God? Psalm 31, 19 says those words. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and work for those who take refuge in you. God has an abundance of great things for your life. He knows what's best. He's wise, loving, and sovereign. And he's saying, just trust me, just trust me, just trust me. Even though he knows That's hard for every one of us to do. I want you to stand for closing prayer. And just with your sort of eyes closed and just thinking of all that I've said, and I know some of you feel convicted and some of you probably think I'm way off base, and that's okay. Some of you are not sure what to think about it, but I want you to Think about that thing that you fear this morning and I want you to clench your fist. Just clench your fist right now and say, I'm holding in my hand the very thing I fear. I I encourage you to do this. Clench your fist and say, this is what I'm holding on to. This is the fear that I fear the most. And you can feel the tension in your hands and you can feel the grasping. And you don't want to do anything but try to work it out because you want which is in your hand. You want to give in to that fear for whatever you're looking for. And then I want you to imagine this morning that your hands are now open. 
and you have released that very thing that you're afraid of and you've released it to God and say, okay, God, I'm trusting you with my fear. And I'm gonna trust you completely today. I'm gonna obey you on this deal. Maybe I haven't been, but I'm gonna start now. And I'm gonna release what I'm afraid of and I'm just gonna release it to you because I trust you for it. Father God, with open hands we come. And we cast all our fears, all our cares, all our struggles, all our challenges, and we cast them over to you. Because in your word it says when we do that, you'll handle them because you love us. And you care for us. And you want the very best for us. And so we release them. And we know it could be hard. And we want to re-grasp and re-grip the things we're afraid of. It'll come naturally. But Lord, keep working on us to have open hands. That we may release everything over to you that we fear. Whatever it is this day, may we release it to you. Jesus, you said to us that in this world we'd have trouble. We'd have things we're afraid of, and we would grasp things because of fear. But you said that in you, when we put our trust in you, when we live in you, and have a relationship with you, you give us peace. And this morning, as we release these things to you, we don't have perfect peace because we're a little bit afraid. But we know and we trust and we release them to you this morning. And we just ask that you would just free us from the fear that we feel. And teach us to and have the courage to trust in you completely. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this message. To hear it again or other messages, please visit us at lakesidechurch.ca.